2 Samuel tonight, 2 Samuel chapter 12. Actually, before we look at chapter 12, which Brother Rudy's already read to us, uh, let's look at chapter 11, in the last two verses of chapter 11. Now, the title of the message tonight is The Parable of the Ewe Lamb. The Parable of the Ewe Lamb. And you might think, Pastor Jonathan, I thought we were finished with all the parables uh, on Sunday Sunday nights, but uh, we, we didn't finish. We just scratched the surface of Christ's parables. We looked at seven of Christ's parables from Matthew chapter 13. And of course, the Lord's the parables that came from the mouth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, are absolutely amazing to study. And uh, there's so many more that we could study, but, but what I wanted to do just for a few weeks on Sunday nights is to look at some parables from the Old Testament. And uh, Jesus was the master parable teller, but he wasn't the first uh, man who used parables. And there's many parables in the Old Testament, and uh, I think that one of the most powerful ones in the Old Testament is found right here in 2 Samuel chapter 12. This, this, this parable of the ewe lamb. At first, David doesn't know, he doesn't realize that it is a parable. Uh, but it's about him and his life, and uh, God was trying to get his attention. Sometimes God tries to use things to get our attention. We're, we're living in a, a dangerous place. We're living in a place where sin will get, will get us totally off track. Uh, this sin-cursed world. And, uh, and God's trying to get David's attention in, in his life. Now, this, the, uh, let's read the last two verses of uh, chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. Verse 26 and 27. Before we uh, look at chapter 12, it says, And when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Let's pray together, may we? Father, we thank you so much for the warnings that you give us, as well as the uh, the, the blessings that you tell us that we can have if we walk close to you. Father, sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need to be woken up when we put our consciences to sleep and we go off into sin. Father, I thank you so much that you have a way of waking our consciences back up again to realize what, we, what we've done. And thank you that we can learn from David's example here in this uh, chapter as well tonight. Father, we pray that you'll give us understanding hearts. Help me as I preach. Give me wisdom. Give me power from the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit's help to be able to speak your word boldly and, and clearly. Father, we pray that you'll allow each person listening to be able to apply your word to their hearts as you want each Christian to do here tonight. And Father, we pray for our church to be strong, uh, to be strong and not weakened by this type of thing that David was weakened by, and help us to realize it tonight and apply it and change our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, this book of 2 Samuel covers about 40 years of David's life. It covers the reign of King David. Uh, now, the, the key verse of 2 Samuel, just as a way, by way of interest, is chapter 5, if you want to turn to chapter 5. And this tells you what the whole book is about. It's about David's reign. And it was 40 years, as I said, there were 7 years uh, over Judah and 33 years over the rest of Israel and Judah, and it says that in chapter 5, in verses 4 and 5, it says, David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. Of course, 1 Samuel is about King Saul and how uh, the kingdom was, was ripped from Saul, just as Saul ripped the, the, the tunic of Samuel as he was leaving. After he told him, that he, he said, the kingdom will be ripped from you. And then, he, of course, he went to David's house, and uh, he anointed young shepherd boy David to be the king. And, of course, Saul, 1 Samuel is all about how Saul chased David and was jealous of David. But then, finally, in 2 Samuel, he becomes the king. And this is, this is what it's about. But chapters 1 to 10 of 2 Samuel, David is triumphing as the king. He's triumphing as the result of faith. In chapters 1 to 10, you see that triumph as the result of David's faith. And in chapters 1 to 10, David knows no defeats at all. 
He's a man after God's own heart, as God says himself when he anoints him. And so uh, chapters 1 to 10 is triumph, but chapters 11 and onward, you see trouble. Chapters uh, 11 to 24, you see Dave, not David's triumphs, but David's troubles. What was the turning point in this book? The turning point was this sin that David committed. Chapters 11 and onward, David experiences personal defeat, and then the rest of the book is the troubles that come from that. And he's a man, not a, he's, he's no longer a man after God's own heart. He's a man with a broken heart. And you know what? All sin, whether it's in the life of the king, or in the life of a peasant, or the life of you or me tonight, sin brings bitter suffering. And that's what happens in the life of David. But he, for a whole year after he sinned, it seems, uh, during the, the, the pregnancy of his wife, uh, and and uh, before that, uh, when he started for about a whole year, it seemed like David had gotten away with it. It seemed like David had covered all of his tracks. It seemed like David had had uh, had swept it all under the rug. But one of the key words in the book of Two Samuel, one of the key phrases, I should say, is the phrase that you keep seeing it over and over again: "Before the Lord." That's the key phrase in the book of Two Samuel. And you see that phrase over and over. I don't, I don't, I don't know how many times it, it occurs, but you'll notice as you read the book of 2 Samuel, and, and you know this son was, this sin was done also before the Lord. He saw it. You couldn't hide it from him. You know, sometimes we, we think about God, and we think maybe God is like uh, uh, way up in the sky and just looking down on us like a bunch of ants going about our business, doing all of our stuff, but that's not the case at all. God knows every single thing about us. Psalm 139 says He knows our, our uprising, our downsitting. He knows, uh, he knows our very thoughts. He knows every, every hair on our heads is numbered. He knows everything about us. He's our Father. And when we go into sin, He cares about us. He's trying to get us back. And so this parable is about uh, what, how God is going to try to bring His wandering son, the King of Israel, back to Him. And you know... Uh, he tried to get Saul to go back to him, but Saul rebelled against it, and the kingdom was stripped from him. But how's David going to react? This is a, probably a much bigger sin than Saul uh, committed in the beginning, but yet David is going to, to learn how to get, become a man after God's own heart once again. So the parable of the ewe lamb. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that there's a principle that David encountered in his life, a principle that David encountered. And that, that principle is that David's sin and all sin does not go unnoticed. We might think that it goes unnoticed. Uh, we might think, you know, maybe maybe uh, after the baby was born, you know, uh, Bathsheba was pushing her little baby through the palace and and uh, in the pram or whatever. And maybe, maybe David thought it's gone unnoticed. Nobody knows. Maybe there were a few raised eyebrows in the palace over what had happened. But for the most part, he'd covered it up. But it had not gone unnoticed. God had a plan to bring him back. People don't seek God out usually when they're in sin, but God seeks them out and he gets them to wake up to what they're doing. And God, we're his children, God loves us. God, all but this, this principle that David encountered was that when he does notice our sin and when he does bring it to our attention, God can instantly and completely forgive our sin when it's confessed and there's genuine repentance. That's a good thing, isn't it? But God rarely ever will take away the consequences of that sin. And David had to learn that for himself. Verse 13, David says, and David, of chapter 12, and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. And so he, he found instant Forgiveness. Instantly he was forgiven. and Because what does it say in, uh, in verse 13? It says, The Lord hath put away thy sin. Instantly he was forgiven, but after that he still has lots of consequences for his sin. And sometimes we, we, we are forgiven, but we still reap what we have sown. It says in verse 14, Howbeit because of by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee, shall surely die. So here's a servant of the truth who's coming to David. He's telling him that he's just telling him the truth and 
And uh, how does he do it? He's trying to give them this principle that you reap what you sow. Whenever you commit a sin, the consequence for that sin is born with that sin. This is a principle that is found in the Word of God. When you sin against God, the, the penalty for that sin is born with it as soon as you commit that sin. And if you could see the penalty, you would never commit the sin. But we don't think about the penalty, do we? And David wasn't thinking about all the consequences that he would face in the rest of this book. But, uh, but he, he, when he committed that sin with Bathsheba, he was also getting the consequences for it as well. But he was forgiven. He didn't die. God is, is gracious and merciful, is he not? Uh, he, the Bible, he, he later on goes on to say against, in Psalm 51, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this great evil in thy sight. And he found forgiveness, he found cleansing, he was able to be purged and cleansed as white as snow, as it says in Psalm 51, in his soul. And God did have mercy upon him. It says, you will not die. And you know what, if you're a Christian here today and you've sinned against God, the good news is that God's mercy is broad, broader than the scope of our transgressions. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, as we've sung about. Higher than the mountains, uh, sparkling like a fountain, wonderful grace to even me. And, and God gives that grace to us. He's wonderfully kind, and yet he's, uh, he, he will not die. We won't die when we sin against God. We've been forgiven. We've been given eternal life. And yet there's still sometimes some things that we have to face that we can't take back. And so what does God do? God does something here. God has to get his attention. And so he... Uh, he he calls someone. Uh, the Bible tells us that uh, uh, God knew about it. And uh, Numbers 32, verse, tw verse 23, it says, Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, 23. And so David's sin was known to nobody. And yet here comes Nathan the prophet. How did he know about it? Well, the Bible says in verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. So the first thing we see is that God was doing something by calling Nathan. We see Nathan's calling. We see who Nathan was in verse 25 of chapter 12. It says, and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet. We never got that part of verse 25, but we see that Nathan was a prophet. In uh, what is a prophet? Now a prophet is somebody who is uh, uh, a servant of God. They don't care uh, if their message is unpopular. Prophets are always unpopular. You know, especially with the priests. The priests didn't like the prophets because uh, the, the, the priests were usually arrogant. They thought they had everything under control. And usually the kings, they didn't like the prophets either because the, the prophets would challenge the kings. But the prophets, they were servants of God, servants of the truth. And they were unwelcome to those who had reason of their own for evading the truth. They would want to hide the truth. But uh, so at, in the past... Nathan had been David's friend and David's advisor. Uh, he had advised David about whether he should build the temple or not. Nathan had. And da Nathan is the one who most likely wrote the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, we, think, we think of Samuel, but of course Samuel died in the book of 1 Samuel. So uh, Nathan is continuing the book of Samuel by writing 2 Samuel. But, but he was a prophet of God. What is a prophet? A prophet is someone who can see. In 1 Samuel 9, it said that Samuel the prophet, he, was a, he calls him a seer, S-E-E-R. A seer is somebody who could see what God, what's, what God is doing. They could see what's going on. And they, he, they were a voice to the people. And so uh, he, he maybe have thought nobody saw, but there was a man who did see, and that was Nathan the seer. David may have thought nobody knew, and, and uh, but the Bible says the Lord sent Nathan. We see Nathan's calling, but we also see Nathan's courage. You know, Nathan went before the king. He had a message from God. You know, he may have been nervous about going to David the king. They had been friends in the past, but but uh, you know, when people, when someone's in sin, they act differently, don't they? When somebody's living in sin, they they're not themselves. And David could have easily said, "Take this prophet away." That's what a lot of the prophets, when they when they went to the evil kings of Israel, in Israel's history later on, they would say, take this prophet away. Uh, Jeremiah was thrown into a pit. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah was put into a hollow log and cut in half. And so many times that happened. But Nathan, we see Nathan's courage. Da uh, David is living very low. He's been living very carnally. But, uh, uh, and, and, but you know what? He still went to him. You know, there's some people who, some prophets who hesitate. Jeremiah said, Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Moses said, 
I can't go to Pharaoh because I'm not eloquent. They won't listen to me. But in the end, he did. He had the courage. And he marched into the courtroom in, in Egypt. And he said, "Let my God says, let my people go. You know, uh, Elijah, he marched up to wicked King Ahab. And he said, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. He marched up to the top of Mount Carmel and faced the 400 prophets of Baal and the whole nation. And he didn't have, you know, there's uh, Jeremiah. He, he preached to wayward Judah. There's John the Baptist who preached to Herod. Prophets are people who have courage. And uh, you know, there's so many times where, where we have people who don't have courage in our day. People don't confront sin. They're, they're more, the pre sometimes the preachers that you see uh, sometimes on television, they're, they're, they're wanting to be accepted by people more than trying to let the, let the Lord accept them and be accepted with the Lord. You know, they, there's these mealy-mouthed preachers on television. They're, they don't speak out against sin. And I'm sure you've seen those as well. And they're more influenced th than, by the culture than they are trying to impact and change the culture. And uh, they're looking for a following instead of trying to be faithful to the Lord, looking for a fat paycheck instead of looking for the approval and the applause of God. But that Nathan wasn't like that. He marched up to uh, David and said that. We also see not only David's, uh, Nathan's calling and his courage, but we see his character. Uh, you know, he wasn't serving at the pleasure of the king, but he's serving at the uh, for the pleasure of God. And I'm sure that Nathan's character had to be right as well because David was the judge of the, of the nation as the king. He was the judge, and yet what he was doing was hip, hypocritical. David was being hypocritical. He was judging others, and yet he himself had sin in his life. And we see that here. He said, let's put this man to death in the parable, and yet he was the one guilty of that parable. And so I'm sure that Nathan himself had to have the right character in order to confront him about it. If Nathan had had any sin in his life, he could never have confronted David about his own integrity. You know, but uh, pastors, we have to ha have these things as well in our lives. You know, in the Bible, there's a list of things that pastors and deacons have to meet, mandates and, and qualifications. And why is that? Because a pastor should not be a hypocrite. But if we're if you're going to speak the word of God to other people. You can't be a hypocrite either. It's not just for pastors and deacons. We should all have integrity. So we see that uh, this man, Nathan, he had conviction, he had courage, he had a calling, and he had a character. And he, so God sent him, and, he, and, he, and God had him speak for him. And what did Nathan speak for God? He spoke a parable. What is a parable? A, par a parable is a message that's designed to be comparative. It's a message alongside a teaching. It's a message from God. And so we see here this parable. We see, let's read the parable once again in verse number two. In verse number one, I'm sorry. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a, as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Here's a parable, a parable that's designed to be comparative, but who do you think that the rich man in this parable is? Let's break this up for just a moment. The rich man is, of course, David in this sordid affair that he had. Uh, the poor man is Uriah. What did David do? He had, he had went up to a rooftop. He had seen Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop. He said, I want that woman. And But then he found out that one of his mighty men, one of David's mighty men was married to that woman, Uriah. And so one of he he had he, he brought he he took Bathsheba in unto him and she became expectant of a baby. And then of course in order to try to cover it up, he covered up his adultery with lies. He brought in Uriah and he said, You've you've been fighting so long on the front lines of the battlefield, why don't you go in into your wife? You deserve it. You deserve a rest. And Uriah said, How could I rest and go home when all my men are, are camping out in the 
field. That wouldn't be right. So Uriah said, no, I won't go into my life. So his cover-up didn't work. His lie, David's lie didn't work. So the next thing David did was he, had, he committed not only adultery and lie, but he had a, a triplet sin of adultery, lying, and murder. And he wrote to his general Joab and said, Joab, I want you to put Uriah at the front lines of the battle, and then I want you to back away from him so that he'll be killed. And uh, that's exactly what happened. He made someone else complicit in this murder. He made Joab complicit. And Joab always knew what was written in that letter. And from then on, there were problems between David and Joab. Uh, in fact, in the end, David had to have Joab put to death because he became disloyal to him. You know? but, uh, but, there, but I believe all those problems started when he made other people complicit in trying to cover up this lie. And so David, he had everything he needed. Why did he need someone else's wife? But he took her. He took her. Uh, Uriah is the poor man. David is the rich man. And the little ewe lamb is Bathsheba. But you know, there's another man in this parable. And uh, if you look at it carefully, there's another man, that, another character that we see on the scene. Behind the scenes, something else was going on. Something sinister and something sordid was going on in the background uh, on this scene of this parable. And that was that there was a, a traveler who was, who was behind it all. It says there in verse 4, And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared the take of his own flock and his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that had come to him. So that man is mentioned three times in verse 4. Who is this man that travels throughout the world? A wayfaring man. Well, the book of Job tells us about a character who does travel throughout the world. And uh, we see that in Job, Job chapter 1, verse 13. It says, And there was a day, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 of Job, it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. You know, and he, he, was, he was going to try to get Job. And so that's the devil. The devil is a wayfaring man. He goes all over the world to and fro, up and down, seeking whom he may devour, the book of 1 Peter tells us, as a roaring lion. And so this is, I believe that that is this traveler, this traveler, this traveler had, who had come uh, to David. And David had, was the rich man who had invited the traveler into his house and it entertained him. You know, temptation isn't sin. Just just the traveler walking by your house, that's not sin. But if you invite him to come into your house and you entertain the thoughts that he's trying to get you to do, you know, that that's sin. And David went eventually David didn't just invite him into his house, but he went looking for that man. He went looking. He went up to the rooftop and he would he would let his eye linger where it should not have been. And so many times we do that as well. We don't only let the devil into our minds and let, let our flesh tell us what to do with sin as well. He's another enemy that travels with us everywhere, our flesh. But we then we, we start even looking for sin. We go looking for it. What a terrible thing that is. And, and David had got himself into this. He entertained this man. And this is a parable of a dinner, of a feast. And, but you know what? There's another person who, who is at the feast that David never saw. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a, we went to um, John Wesley's house up in Epworth, John and Charles Wesley's house. And uh, Susanna Wesley, she raised all of her children up there. I think she had 17 children or something like that. But she would spend an hour uh, uh, every week in, with each individual child. And many of her children became preachers and preachers' wives. And, but, uh, how, but one of the things that she had hanging on the wall at the house in Epworth was that little poem that you may have heard before, uh, that Jesus is an unseen guest at every meal, uh, you know, uh, uh, the silent listener to every conversation. Um, the I can't remember all the rest, but he's he's always there. He's the silent one. He's all, and we should remember that as well. The Lord had seen this. He was the unseen guest at this dinner party that this rich man had with this traveler. You know, this this rich man. He wanted to look as if he was generous and if he was hospitable. He said, I'm going to make you a great meal. I'm going to entertain you. 
And, you know, so many times we, David may, you know, this rich man may have said, well, I'm doing a good thing. I'm trying to get, make myself have a good reputation. And David was more re worried about his reputation than his integrity. He thought, well, I have a wife, a, a new wife, you know, Bathsheba. I, I made me happy. It's made me happier. It's, it's fulfilled a need that I had, maybe he said to himself. But he wasn't thinking about his integrity. All he thought about was his reputation. He tried to cover it up, cover it up, cover it up. Why? Because people are so worried about their reputation. In the Bible school, we talked about integrity recently and how there's so little of it. But we, we gave a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln said, uh, he said, integrity is the tree. Your reputation is the shadow. If you take care of your integrity, your reputation will take care of itself. Actually, a better way of saying that we said is, if you take care of your integrity, God will take care of your reputation. Let God take care of your reputation. And, but David was more worried about his reputation as the king than he was about his integrity. He could have stopped it uh, even after the first, even after after the sin had been committed. He could have gotten right with God. He could have lit, it, lit the light in. But so many times we don't want to shine the light on ourselves. Should we shine it on other people? And he's 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 judging others. And so uh, he's, he, he hears this story, and this is the perfect illustration for David and his, his life. He had invited the wayfaring man, and he had taken the most precious possession of the poor man. He had had many wives, but he had took the one wife of Uriah to fulfill his passions. He had stolen something, you know. I hate, it's a terrible thing to steal, isn't it? I hate when, to hear about people stealing, but it's even worse when a rich man steals from a poor man. And that's what David had done. The Bible is very clear that stealing something that's not yours gets people into a lot of trouble and the consequences that happen from it. Think about Adam. You know, Adam in the Garden of Eden. He could eat any of the trees, any of the fruit, but he took the one that he was that was not his. He took what was not his. And what were, there's consequences for that, aren't there? David's going to face consequences. Adam faced... We're still experiencing... The, the consequences to this day of what Adam experienced in me. He took what wasn't his. Abraham, he went down to Egypt. He lied to the, to the Pharaoh. He said, he said that his wife Sarah was his sister so that nobody would try to, to abuse her. But he lied, and then he came out of Egypt with Hagar. And, uh, you know, he lay with Hagar, had... He didn't wait on God's timing for, for, the, for Isaac to be born. And Ishmael was born. And again, consequences. He took what was not his to take. And the consequences to this day between the Israelites and the people in, in Israel, between the descendants of, of Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, you know, other people who took what wasn't... We, we learned in, in the book of Joshua about Moses and how uh, he had taken God's glory, didn't he? He said, ye rebels, must we bring water from a rock? And he took God's glory and he hit the rock. And what was the consequences? He could never go into the promised land. We see Samson, you know, he took something that wasn't his as well. He, he took uh, uh, Delilah. And what were the consequences? He, there were great consequences. He ended up chained to the Philistine temple and ended up dying there. We think about Jacob. He lied, you know, uh, but he had to face his consequences when he faced the same Deceit. He took something that was not his. He took the birthright, but he faced the same deceit from his uncle Laban. We think of Achan, don't we? We think of Achan, how he took something that wasn't his. He took that Babylonian garment and the and the bit of gold. And uh, you know, he confessed. All these people, they all were forgiven, but they still had to face consequences. And that's the same with you and me. Adam was forgiven. He got a covering for his sin, but he still had to face it. Abraham, he was forgiven. But there's still consequences to this day. Moses, he was forgiven, but he couldn't go to the promised land. Jacob, he got forgiven, but he still had to face a difficult life. Samson was forgiven. He got his strength back, but he, he ended up dying. Achan, he confessed it and gave glory to God. And Achan was forgiven, but he still had to die as well, didn't he? And his family. It affected his family as well. I'm sure as Achan dug up the floor of his tent, that his wife must have known about it, you know? And his children as well. And, you know, I'm sure that if somebody started uh, digging up your kitchen floor, Rob, that Ulrika would know about. It. And so, uh, but uh, 
Achan and his whole family had to pay the consequences. And, and there's consequences for David as well. And so in this parable, we see this probing parable. It probes deeply into David's life. And I'm sure it really was designed to get his attention because it's all about sheep. Do you remember, David wasn't just the king of Israel. He had, been the he had been the shepherd as well as a young man. And so I'm sure he loved sheep. We, we don't think about sheep in the way that you know, they used to think about sheep. We wouldn't think of a sheep as a pet, really. Uh, we think of dogs and cats. But, but Israelites, they thought that dogs were unclean creatures. They were, they were terrible creatures to have as a pet. But they loved sheep. And so I'm sure as Nathan was telling this story about this man who, who bought this little sheep... And he loved it. He nourished it. He, and he probably thought, oh, that's so wonderful. You know, as, Day, as Nathan's telling this story, he, he, what did he do with that sheep? He, he, he brought it into his own house. Oh, that's great. He, he, he let it eat from his own cup. Oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, you have to really love your animal to let it eat for, drink from your own cup. I, I would never let my cats drink from my cup. But I've seen people who love their animals that much to do But he loved this sheep. He let it drink from its own cup. He, he let it sleep with him. It was as his own daughter. And so it really pulled David's heartstrings. And then he said, this rich man came and took it and uh, killed it and uh, dressed it for the man who was come to him. He, he didn't want to take from his own field. And so it really got David's attention. But it wasn't just a probing parable. It brought out the problem in David's life. As, da as king, David had the right to pass judgment. And so he passes judgment. He says, it says in verse 5, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. You know, he says, they're going to pay fourfold. They're going to die. You know, but legally, he wasn't allowed to kill this man for, this, for just stealing a sheep. But legally, from a book of Exodus, he was allowed to tell him to pay back fourfold. That's what Exodus says. So he says, I'm going to do everything that I can to get justice for this man. You know, David ended up paying fourfold for his stealing Bathsheba as well. His child died. The child that came from the affair. His son, uh, Abnon, he had uh, this thing for his sister, Tamar. And uh, he had a friend. It says Amnon had a friend, a wicked friend, who talked him into, into raping his half-sister Tamar. So uh, then Absalom was so mad about that, so Absalom killed David's son Amnon. And then Abs David's son Absalom ended up rebelling against King David. And uh, he ended up uh, leading a revolt against his own father. And uh, David told Joab, don't kill him. Please don't kill him. But Joab... He knew David's hypocrisy because he's the one who had carried out that, that letter on the battlefield. And, and he said, I'm just going to get rid of this whole bad, terrible mess once and for all. And he stuck a, a dagger through Absalom's heart as he hung from his long hair, long rebellious hair from the tree. And he killed him. And so David, three of David's sons were killed. One of his daughters was uh, violated. And so David did. He, he fulfilled his own judgment. And uh, I'm sure he wasn't thinking about those things when his sense of outrage, his, his sense of justice was outraged. He demanded punishment. He never would have committed the sin if he knew the punishment for it. And yet, then it came. He was, he was rising up in anger, getting more and more angry at this other person. But then the, the, the word came like forked lightning, I'm sure, to David's heart. Thou art the man. And I'm sure and all of a sudden, David's conscience, which he had buried was exposed. The nerve endings were back again and he 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 was humili he was in humiliation. He was humble once again. And I'm sure he sank back into his throne chair, humbled to the dust, and the truth had grabbed at those naked nerves that had been exposed. And and uh, then there's a powerful confrontation that we see there. The probing, the problem and the powerful confrontation as Nathan points that finger and says, Thou art the man. And then he's followed by a lengthy indictment of, of David. He says in verses 7 to 9, he says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of, of Israel and of Judah. 
And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? And that's, that's the key. He had despised the goodness of God in his life. He despised it. It says it again. That word despise is found in verse 10. It says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me. God says you've despised me. You've despised my goodness in your life. You know, what about us? God's so good to us, isn't he? And we should, you know, we think about that song, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So many times we, we just think about the negatives of life, and uh, I'm not diminishing the problems that people go through, and, and there's big problems that people are going through right now, I'm sure, but, but there's lots of blessings as well. And we get so blessed that we get complacent, and we get indifferent to what God's doing, and we let the devil come in. And he wants to destroy us. And so he not only gives him the, the uh, indictment, but he gives them a sentence in verses 10 to 12. He tells them what's going to happen. And, uh, and, and that came to pass. In fact, he says, you did this thing in secret, but all, all Israel is going to know about what you did. And it's going to be done on the rooftops. Absalom, his son, David's son, went into his father's wives on the rooftop of the palace. Just as, just as Nathan said was going to happen. And he, 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 uh, he did that shameful thing, that shameful thing on the rooftop of the palace in front of the whole nation. And the whole, he was mocking his father. He said, Father, I know you're a hypocrite, and I'm going to go in and do this thing. And uh, what a terrible thing that, that David saw. If David could have somehow seen the end of the sin before the beginning of the sin, he never, never, never would have done it. But he thought he had. He thought it all looked really good. He thought he had, he could satisfy this need. But just like a mouse in a trap, you know, uh, you know they, they, they say that mice uh, they they are creatures of habit. And uh, if you find out where the mice have been in your house, you put the, you can put the trap at the same spot, and they'll come back to where they've been before, and you can trap them. You put the little piece of cheese in there, and they they get trapped, don't they? And the devil, he knows us. He knows he's a, he knows that we're creatures of habit as well. He 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 looks at us. He he gets the temptation that would be bad for us. He puts it in our path. But what we should do is never step one foot down that pathway. Think about the end. You know, I'm sure that if the prodigal son could have seen what was waiting for him in the hog pen, he never would have left the, his father's mansion. Uh, and left all the he had all the food he could eat. He had all the clothes he could want, but he ended up in the hog pen. But he he, he uh, you think about uh, he spent it. He says when he had spent all, he thought about what he had done. You know, that's what sin does to you. It makes you spend so much more than you had ever imagined. Th just remember this phrase. You may have heard it before. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. I'm sure Lot would have never pitched his tent towards Sodom if he could see the end of the consequence of that, about his children turning away from God, about his children, uh, his, his, uh, children becoming sinful in their hearts, about his wife getting that in her heart and turning into a pillar of salt as they left. I'm sure... Uh, you know, he, he thought, well, if I just could live in Sodom, I could have a little bit more money in my bank account. I could have a little bit more money in my retirement uh, nest egg or something like that. But he wasn't thinking about his family, was he, at that point, when he made that sinful decision. And so we should think about the right, the right things to think about when we're, when we're about to sit, put our foot down the wrong path. And David should have thought of that too. He lost his children just like Lot did. And uh, he did something that caused him to lose credibility with his children. And you know what? We think the same thing. We can think, well, I'll be the exception to the rule. I can do this and not get caught into it. I can, but we, sh we shouldn't think like that. The devil has had many, many casualties, and we just need to not start down that road at all. Galatians 6, verse 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And that's, uh, that's, that's a principle from God's word. We reap what we sow. It says, For he that soweth to the flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption, 
but he that sowed to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know, we talked about all those Old Testament people who reap what they sow, what they sue, sowed. Uh, but it's a New Testament principle too for us. We Galatians 6, 7. And uh, we reap what we sow, but we also reap more than we sow. You know, the Bible says in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, For they have sown the wind, but they shall reap the whirlwind. We sow a little kernel of corn, but we get a whole lot more corn from that one little kernel. We reap what we sow, we reap later than we sow, and we reap more than we sow. And uh, he, well, he didn't die for his sin. That's grace, God's grace. He didn't have to die. He got to stay as the king even. And that's all God's grace, his wonderful grace. But he still had to be chased, and he still had to face the consequences. And we still have, uh, even though we are going to die for our sins, we still have to be chased, and we still have to face the consequences, but we still have God to help us to face the consequences. And so that's what David did. He said, Lord, I'll face the consequences, but I trust you, and he fell upon God. And, uh, you know, one time, another time David made another sin. He, he numbered the people when he wasn't supposed to number the people. And he had to choose which uh, punishment he was going to get for doing that. And uh, one of the choices was the hand of the Lord will come for so many days, I think it was three days, or you'll have famine for so many months, or, or, you'll, have, uh, or you'll lose to your enemies on the battlefield. And he said, I'll take the one where we, we fall by the hand of the Lord, because it's better to fall into the hands of God than into the hands of men. So what, what should we do? If we've sinned, we should just Face it straight away. Shine the light on us. But the worst thing that you can do is to cover it up and judge other people. That's what David did. He was judging this man in the parable, and yet he didn't shine the light on himself. That's really what this parable of the ewe lamb is really all about. You know, don't try to judge other people by one standard and yourself by a different standard. You know, people, they try to shine the spotlight on other people to try to get the people from looking at themselves. But we, what we should do, we should shine the light on ourselves and say, God, search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my ways. See if there be some wicked way in me. And so shine the light on ourselves, not on other people. Now, the, one of the um, key interpretations of this parable, and we'll end with this, is found in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. David was sitting in judgment as the king of Israel, and yet... He had committed an inexcusable sin. It was inexcusable because he was judging others when he himself had this problem. And Romans chapter 2, verse 1, you, you could have said this, Nathan could have said this directly to David's face. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou, hast, thou that judgest doest the same things. That could have been said to David. You're judging this man for what he did for this new lamb in this parable, but you're doing the same thing. So you're inexcusable for judging another. And so we should remember that as well. We, we are, we're sinning without excuse. We are inexcusable before God. And uh, we should ask the Lord to open us up and judge us from his word. And uh, ask the Lord to help us with any selfishness that we may have. And finally, David experienced God's power, though. God's still, hand was still at work with him. He was still God's man. And uh, he, the curse was lifted off of his life. And he was able to c c face life as a humble man once again. I, I don't know about you, but we should face life with humility. If, if you have sinned, that's okay. You can find forgiveness and you can live the rest of your life with humility. You can live the rest of your life knowing that God's given you grace. You can live the rest of your life knowing that God's shown you mercy and you can show it to other people as well. And uh, we should come to the Lord and ask Him to, His Spirit to cleanse us, to help us. You know, there was a, uh, in 1520, one man brought smallpox to Mexico. Three and a half million people died. In 1348, one man stepped off of a boat onto the shores of England, and he brought the bubonic plague onto the shores of England, and over half of England's population was destroyed. You know, we don't know what one man, one man's sin can do, and David was that one man. He, it doesn't take much 
to stop you. It just takes one bullet to kill somebody. And uh, as the old preachers say, the chickens will come home to roost. So if you, you'll reap what you sow. So don't throw it all away. Come to the Lord. Ask Him to help you with, and help you not to go down the, that road. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for Your wonderful grace. Father, I pray that You'll help us to realize that we're, we're just sinners saved by grace. We are, uh, we're not strong enough to face temptations on our own. Father, we thank You so much that uh, there was, there's grace and forgiveness and there's strength to get back on the right path if we've gone down the right one, wrong one. But there's also strength and help to not go down that path in the first place. Father, I pray that You'll help us to have liberty in Christ. Not liberty to sin, but liberty to not sin. Liberty to, to be able to have Your strength and grace to keep from sinning as You've given us in Your Word. Uh, and with the help of your Holy Spirit. Help us not to use the liberty that you give us as an excuse uh, to sin. Help us to use it uh, for your honor and glory. Father, thank you for the example of David. Help us to learn from it tonight. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. We've sung about, we've, we've learned about David, the, the great shepherd, who found the Lord's help and shepherd in hand once again.